Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is January 21st, 2022. So I just put up a video on the channel dealing with a couple of articles that spotlighted a anti-vaccine nurse who was crying about, you know, she had to leave her job because the hospital didn't believe her religious exemption, which maybe shouldn't be a thing in the first place for partly precisely that reason. But in any case, um, touching on this whole subject of anti-vaccine, anti-mask, anti-shutdown activism, which we've been seeing since the beginning of the pandemic, and here, of course, is a picture of a boogaloo boy uh, with his Hawaiian shirt, get back to work, banner, and heavy weaponry. This is from back when they were trying to reopen small businesses. Remember when all the people were like, I need to get my hair cut. Yeah, it was from that time. So back then, I did some videos on astroturfing, which is, you know, of course, astroturf, it's a reference to grassroots. So astroturf is fake grass. Therefore, astroturfing is when movements are not sincere. They're not authentically grassroots and popular. They are mainly just funded by some right-wing foundation or think tank or something with a lot of money. Now, in the realm of, you know, right-wing protests and right-wing politics, of course, you can get random individuals believing in right-wing ideas, etc., and then staging some protest about it. Uh, although, I mean, because those interests align so much with reactionary capital, um, you know, I, I think it's usually not long before a right-wing protest winds up getting funded by these people. The, you know, the billionaires get involved and they start spinning it in whatever way. I mean, and that can happen with some ostensibly left causes, too. You know, money can get involved and try to divert the protest. Uh, although in the case of the right-wing ones, really, they don't need to divert the protest because, you know, right-wing interests basically favor capital in the first place, whether or not the people uh, advocating them realize that or not. But anyway, here we have an article. This is from trutherfiction.com titled Anatomy of an Inauthentically Organized Campaign by Brooke Binkowski from July 23rd, 2021. And I think that this is a pretty good run-through of, you know, when you're evaluating a campaign, looking, is this sincere, isn't it? And, um, you know, speaking of the right-wing anti-vax and things like that uh, movements, it's important to have these kinds of questions going on in your mind. Because off the top of my head, I recall in at least one of the articles that I did about the reopen protests, they were funded by like Betsy DeVos's family. Um, you know, is that really in the best interest of workers? Probably not. Anyway, let's get into the article and see what it has to say. In mid-2021, as the Delta variant rapidly spread among unvaccinated populations across the United States, and public officials began publicly flirting with the prospect of still more measures to quell the spread of the next phase of the COVID-19 pandemic. Local and national news organizations began to turn their attention to violent, emotionally charged spectacles played out by people claiming to be opposed to mask mandates. In one such event on July 22, 2021, anti-masking activists mocked and attacked a breast cancer patient outside a Los Angeles clinic. Quote, protesters then ask cancer patient Kate Burns if she's familiar with the Civil Rights Act. Quote, get on the right side of history, one man says. You've got a lot of anger you need to release. It's a very dangerous emotion. Continuing the quote from that article, tensions continued to rise as more far-right anti-maskers arrived on the scene. A small group of anti-fascists also arrived and got into altercations with the far-right. A woman holding a megaphone shoved Burns and then punched her several times. Burns said on social media that the woman hit her in the chest and struck her scars. Thursday was the second time that anti-maskers had targeted that particular breast cancer clinic over its mask policy. The ugly scenes and casual political violence that unfolded there on both occasions have become troublingly common across the U.S. Ending that quote. Increasingly confrontational scenes in which apparently aggrieved people make loud scenes for reasons they do not seem to be able to fully describe or explain do indeed seem to be more and more common, and not just in the United States. But why? And how does such activity come to be? The short answer, by harnessing the power of organized phone calls, social media groups, 
and disinformation networks does not reveal much about the actual anatomy of such a campaign. The longer answer is this. Political groups have created a modular form of activism that makes everything from signs to messaging interchangeable, simple, and downloadable. That's not new, nor is it very exciting. Organizing networks for messaging and protesting purposes is a very common practice. But that common and relatively harmless practice is easily weaponized by disinformation campaigns. When modular activism meets existing right-wing disinformation networks, it becomes inauthentic by definition. Bad faith political entities are now tapping into the resentment and rage that they have deliberately incited and provoked in entire groups of like-minded conspiracy theorists in order to get them to show up at protests to make scenes. The topics and ideas behind them don't matter. What matters is the outrage. To put it another way, the algorithm and propaganda networks that were first established for QAnon and other white supremacist and insurrectionist disinformation campaigns have now been turned over to promoting and planning events to set up local and state power grabs. Before the possible return of a mask mandate, many of these protests were around another issue its attendees seemed to be unable to fully articulate, critical race theory, or maybe transgender rights, or vaccines. And there's a quote from a tweet there by Gabriella Border: Two arrests made at the Loudoun County, Virginia school board meeting after it was declared an unlawful assembly. And some parents here, I guess pictured, protested against critical race theory and a transgender policy refused to leave right away. Over time, it becomes obvious that the same groups of people have been showing up to stage these scenes, as can be witnessed with that group of people in Los Angeles at Cedar sinai the same group that attacked cancer patient Kate Burns, shouting invective against masks, vaccines, quarantines, Antifa, and pedophiles, while waving Recall Newsom flags. And there's another tweet there, this one from Sean Beckner Carmichael. Additional note, many of the same people involved in the anti-mask protest or incident have been involved in previous similar incidents, like this one, where a woman told children wearing yarmulkes inside a Target on January 1st, 2021, that, quote, a holocaust is coming. You are contributing to a new holocaust. It is easy to spot authentic versus inauthentic protests. Authentically organized protests, where the people showing up actually care about the topic they are demonstrating for or against, as opposed to simply trying to upset the people that they disagree with politically, stay on message, and while they can be emotional, they lack the quality of inarticulate, braying rage that is all too familiar to anyone who has covered an inauthentically organized event. There are also visual cues and slogans that bear more than a passing resemblance to white supremacist, sovereign citizen, anti-vaxxer, or QAnon catchphrases by design. It's another tweet from Brett Hall. Happening now, people are rallying to, quote, save our students ahead of the VBS schools meeting. Mainly, they want face coverings to be optional in the upcoming school year. Problem is, that's ultimately up to the commissioner. Anyway, save our students, meaning that they don't wear masks. Interesting. A closer look at the Save Our Students rally, which, as mentioned, deliberately echoes the Save Our Children QAnon campaign, turns up some interesting conspiracy theory detritus characteristic of the career gadflies who populate inauthentically organized protests, such as the all-purpose sign behind the speaker in this image. And basically in different ways it says ban masks, ban CRT, ban vaccines. Multiple groups with their own political agendas are coordinating these campaigns for their own purposes. The far-right Heritage Foundation, which has pushed the anti-critical race theory disinformation campaign from its inauthentic beginning, has a website promoting Heritage Action for America, a rotating stable of campaigns that anyone can use for astroturfing if they're so inclined. For example, their Issue Toolkit page on critical race theory, which has been engineered into a right-wing euphemism for any sort of curriculum delving into institutional racism in the United States, comment, and not even delving into it that deeply, but just like talking about the basic history of slavery, for example, I mean, you know racism is a big problem when they basically make it illegal to talk about it. Continuing, contains the following suggested talking points. 
As with their various signs and slogans, these may sound familiar to anyone following the inauthentic moral panics and dramas unfolding in policy discussions and school board meetings. Point one, true equality will be achieved by maximizing the ability of Americans to become self-sufficient, not by dividing Americans on the basis of race and apportioning resources based on skin color. Comment, that's not really what anyone is talking about doing. And um, as far as, you know, maximizing the ability of Americans to become self-sufficient, capitalism runs a process on society called proletarianization. I mean, it doesn't necessarily do this deliberately, but it is the effect of setting up capitalism in your country. It proletarianizes the country. That means that more people become wage workers whose only commodity to sell is labor. So that's pretty much the opposite of self-sufficiency is when you don't own any property and you have to sell your labor to get access to the means of production. And then the trade-off is you get subsistence wages and the capitalist's wealth is multiplied by your labor. That's the opposite of self-sufficiency. So that's not going to result in true equality, except, well, the entire population will become proletarian, at which point we need to just collectivize the means of production. But that's definitely not what they're talking about. They're talking about some dream where we're all rugged individuals, and this is a total fantasy. It's just simply impossible for everyone to be that way, because that idea, rugged individualism, I mean, it's not possible to entirely provide for yourself, and capitalism is a system of exploitation. So without an exploited class, you can't maintain that kind of lifestyle. Anyway, and then, you know, the dividing Americans on the basis of race and portioning resources based on skin color, that's uh, about as bad faith a take as you can possibly have, and I'm going to leave it there. Talking point two, for Americans who care about poverty alleviation and constitutional government. Wait a minute, what? Um... Those are two very different things. But anyway, critical race theory represents a critical threat. If implemented, critical race theory's social policies would continue to erode the key preconditions for advancement, family, education, and work. This is just anti-communist propaganda, but okay. Uh, family, education, and work, and leave ostensibly, quote, favored groups more dependent on public subsidy and redistribution than ever. So commenting there, I'm not going to even dissect this right now. I think probably everyone listening to this channel has a good idea of why that's wrong. We need to fucking eradicate this. We need to eradicate it because it just doesn't, it holds no water at all. So we need to obliterate this and make it impossible for people to even raise these points. They're very old points. They're very tired. Of course, you know, they're being funded by money, but we need to make the understanding of why these things are just utter bullshit, household knowledge. Talking point number three, teachers should not use the goal of teaching diversity of thought, what, as an excuse to teach students to view others through ethnic stereotypes or that America is an irredeemably racist country. Well, you know, we didn't make America's history. America's history was made by people who came before us and you know, it is what it is. Um, one thing that I'd like to share right now is this clip from actually the Dr. Phil show, not a Dr. Phil fan, but in this clip, there is an anti-critical race theory crusader who goes on, you know, the kind of rant that normally is found in Twitter threads only, tries to do it in real life. Everyone is just like, what the fuck are you talking about? Here's the clip. Please welcome co-author of book, uh, Cynical Theories, James Lindsay. James, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Dr. Phil. And you say this should be an artifact. We should just put this behind us. I do not believe the critical race theory tenet that says that racism is the ordinary state of affairs in our society and that if we don't dredge up a race consciousness that we can't get over it. I think this is actually a lie. It's very annoying to me to listen back and, to the back and forth here. In fact, I'm glad to be here to bring some knowledge. I take a lot of umbrage with the idea that we're going to talk about should we have critical race theory, this or that, because it's talking about racism or history, when the fact of the matter is it's not are we, it's how are we. And I am 
shocked and appalled to hear the defensive side for critical race theory misrepresented this way. But they don't explain, for example, why the first paper called Order Critical Race Theory of Education by Gloria Labs and Billings was published in 1995. They don't explain why Richard Delgado's 2001 book explains on page five, for example, that it rapidly spread from law to other disciplines, especially education. They don't explain also in the exact same situation that Gloria Ladson Billings is one of the chief authors of a of a ed equity in Virginia that's bringing critical race theory into all of the state schools of, edu, uh, of, of Virginia right now. You must breathe through your ears because you... <laughs> Yeah. I have read the vast majority of the major works in critical race theory that have been published since 1970, the most recent things, including, for example, in 2017, we have Allison Bailey writing a paper for Hypatia, an education paper, and she says that there's the critical thinking tradition, but what we're doing in critical pedagogy, which critical race theory is an integral, uh, integrated part of, is from a different set of tradition called critical theory, which is neo-Marxism, which is interested in studying the relationships of power rather than epistemic adequacy. You can look the paper up. It's called Tracking Privilege Preserving Epistemic Pushback in Critical Race and Feminist Philosophy Classrooms. That's not being caught in K-12 schools. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Congratulations. Well, all that, all that, you know, that emotional, <laughs> he looks like he's on the verge of tears the entire time. All that, no one knew what the hell he said. And then I love how it's just shot down with yeah, that's not what's being taught in K through 12 schools. End of discussion. Um, so, you know, there's one of the activists, one of these people high on their own farts, just hypercharged, eating, breathing and drinking the stuff 24 seven. It's incomprehensible to everyone else. But here's another clip. This is a better example of like people who oh yeah, I'm against it. Well, what is it? I don't know. This is like more typical of kind of your average supporter of this kind of thing. Like right down to the U.S. Air Force hat, like this guy is right out of central casting. What's the most important issue in the governor's race here in Virginia? Getting back to the basics of teaching children, not teaching them critical race theory. And, uh, and, and what is critical race theory? Well, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it because I don't understand it that much. But it's something that I don't, the, what little bit that I know I don't care for. And, and what have you heard that, that you don't like? Well, that you I'm, don't not, like? I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't have that much knowledge on it, but okay. it's something that I'm not, that I don't care for. So that's some of this stuff in motion. Ugly, ugly stuff. Anyway, continuing, that page, like most of the action toolkit entries, also contains directions on who to call, scripts for what to say, and social media posts for Heritage's Sentinels, nice, to copy and paste on social media. It is easy to find multiple examples of this in practice by searching for any of the text in any of these campaigns on social media. So you can see in the uh, screenshot there, there's a button right there posted on Facebook. So literally with the click of a button, you too can spread Heritage Foundation propaganda. No further thought required. This can be done for any topic, effectively offering the illusion of popularity for policies or ideas that do not exist in reality. But this construct is augmented by real-world events staged by people who in actuality have little loyalty to the ideas they pretend to espouse, leading to messaging that is, to say the least, muddled and confusing. Heritage Action and its dozens of affiliated groups also offers similar toolkits for coronavirus legislation, the Equality Act, immigration, and many others, complete with scripts for phone calls and social media posts. However, the stunts and scripted phone calls and tweets seem to be enough to convince newsrooms and politicians that they are legitimate. And, well, that's... I'm not sure they're entirely convinced, but they certainly present it as authentic. So anyway, and thus these events are being used to push changes across the United States. I mean, honestly, if this random blogger can figure out that it's inauthentic, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the highly paid news team can. It's really their job, though, to spread bourgeois propaganda. So that's literally their job. They're PR firms for the capitalist class. Anyway. As of July 2021, very little coverage of the many, many events that have been planned or interrupted by this type of activity over the years notes its obvious inauthenticity. 
or the fact that it uses established disinformation networks to do this. Nor do many reporters or pundits observe that this behavior spiked during the Trump administration and continues into the Biden administration as the far right once again convulses to regain power. The harm in this, of course, is that it is forcing disinformation into policy that deliberately eludes the actual will of the people, a profoundly anti-democratic campaign. In other words, this is not a sign of emotions running high or an increasingly polarized country. It is a relatively small group of activists who explicitly intend to push policies into reality that are deeply unpopular at best and actively harmful at worst. They're intentionally being pushed by and for the far right in order to get white supremacists, anti-vaccine activists, and other conspiracy theorists into power at all levels so that they can enact whatever agenda against Americans they like. That's the end of this article. So, you know, I just want to note, obviously, this is a glimpse into how the, you know, far right does their dirt and their methods. Of course, the Democratic Party uh, you know, the center right to right. Um, they have their own methods as well. They have their own cons that they run on the people. This is just a glimpse into the further right and their particular doings. It's an important thing to understand as, yes, Trump may no longer be in the White House, but MAGA is not gone. And, you know, the midterms may or may not go uh, the Democrats' way. Joe Biden, the approval rating, not exactly holding up, let's say, and uh, for good reason. We're in a full-on emergency with the pandemic, and they're not acting like it, to put it mildly. So a return of MAGA, I mean, as repulsive as that is, may be in the cards. Um, and, you know, it's just, we're in this endless loop. If working people want an alternative to the Democrats and Republicans, we have to build it. It's that simple. It's not going to like Jesus is not coming. We have to build it ourselves. That's the hard truth, but it also opens up a lot of beautiful possibilities. So I'll leave it at that. What do you think? Questions, comments, leave them in the comment section. We'll continue the discussion there as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for $2 or more. Every one of the donations is encouraging as well as materially helpful. So I appreciate those a lot. Thank you very much for those. If you'd like to help out without making a financial contribution or on top of a financial contribution, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting all helps. Even if it's just good video or thanks, the comment that you leave helps to expand the audience, boost the video in the YouTube algorithm. And we do need to expand the conversation around capitalism and ending it. So whether it has to do with this channel or not, thanks for your contribution in that regard to the socialist movement as a whole. Join an organization back in the real world, or at least consider a donation to one, because all the agitation and education in the world isn't going to do anything if we don't get organized. We've got to get organized. Look for a healthy organization in your area doing that kind of work that you'd like to see more of being done and get involved. Contact them, see if they contact you back fairly quickly. That's usually a decent sign of whether it's functional or not. Getting involved with a dysfunctional organization can be really destructive and a big time waste, so try to avoid that wherever possible. Or start your own project. If you have an idea and the comrades and resources to get it going, we love to see new projects pop up and have some good news in that way. Otherwise, thanks again for watching, and we'll catch you in the next video.